Good morning. Uh, my name is James Harding. I'm the director of news for the BBC. One of the joys of Davos, to my mind, is that moment when you suddenly understand something that for years you thought you had understood and realized that you didn't. And I can't think of a subject where that's more likely to be the case or more necessary than understanding Japan, what's happening both within that country and its place in the world. Um, it's become a subject where people think they know they understand it, and then as, as change, as political reform, as the global context moves, uh, people find that they have to rethink it. Um, we're extremely lucky this morning to have such an eminent panel of people. Um, I appreciate that, uh, um, as Mr. Hasekawa was just pointing out, uh, we are a standing lesson in the ongoing work of, uh, of womenomics in uh, Japan when you look at our, our, our panel. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, that said, um, uh, I hope what we lack in diversity we will make up for in, uh, in range of expertise. Um, let, me, let me start by introducing the panel, uh, but before I do so, I just want to give uh, one uh, note of caution. The one other thing about Davos is, of course, it brings us all together. We understand each other better, and yet there are moments where you discover that people do truly play to their, uh, to their stereotypes or their caricatures. I just wanted to say that I am a British journalist, and uh, you may find that I play a little to my uh, stereotype and caricature <laughs> if I interrupt, if I'm rude, and I try and keep our panel uh, to time, please forgive me. Let me introduce uh, uh, our, our, our panel. Um, uh, Adam Posen, um, uh, many of you will know, he's obviously well known as being a, a, a leading figure on the Monetary Policy Committee uh, in the UK, but is a, a global expert on monetary policy, is a member of the Trilateral Commission uh, and, uh, and joins, joins us this morning. We have the chairman of the board of Mitsubishi Corporation, um, uh, uh, sort of Japan unto himself, really, uh, Yorihiko Ko Kojima, and we're extremely grateful to you uh, for, jo for joining us. Um, uh, Japan, as, uh, as students of the country will know, has a gift for giving its ministers uh, more responsibilities than anyone should probably uh, have to bear. And uh, Shimomura-san uh, is the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. Uh, and in his spare time, uh, he's also the Minister of the Olympics and the Paralympics and the Games of Japan. Um, uh, um, uh, Takenaka-san, Heizo Takenaka, many of you will know he's been a very prominent figure here at the World Economic Forum for uh, many years and is the director of Global Security uh, Research Institute at the Keio, Insti uh, Keio University. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, as I, uh, as I alluded to, to, to begin with, um, uh, Yasuchika uh, Hasegawa uh, is the chairman uh, and the chief executive of Takeda Pharmaceutical. Uh, so um, uh, a great welcome to our panel. Um, just to show how contrary I can be, the, the subject today is understanding Japan's national and global priorities as a result of the recent elections. And just to be contrary, uh, I'm going to start with the, the global issues for Japan first. Because if you all cast your minds back a year ago, when Prime Minister Abe stood up, it was probably the most newsworthy speech of the World Economic Forum last year, the comments that he made about the relationship between China and Japan, the allusions in 2014 to 1914, and I wondered whether or not, um, uh, perhaps starting with you, uh, uh, Kojima-san, you could just give us a sense of whether you think those tensions have eased, whether or not they're simmering still, or whether or not, uh, and whether essentially the worries about the China-Japan relationship are as acute today as they were a year ago. Okay, well, hey, uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your kind introdu introduction. I'm wondering whether as you speak in Japanese or uh, English, but, uh, but uh, he speaks uh, English, therefore yeah. <laughs> I'll try my best. But uh, anyhow, uh, I myself is Yorihiko Kojima of Mitsubishi Corporation, and I'm honored today to be here in such a very distinguished company 
to discuss a, uh, Japan's uh, uh, priorities following the Abe government's uh, victory in the recent gener general election. And the important thing is uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe's economics, and everybody very much interested in it, and how to put your priority in it. I think that is a very important. And uh, well, uh, this cabinet, Prime Minister Abe, formed after winning uh, the great uh, general election uh, last year, has uh, retained all its members except the Minister of Defense. Uh, that should uh, ensure the continuity in policies and the continued emphasis on the economy. On December 27th, it adopted the 3.5 trillion yen economic package that includes measures to stimulate personal consumption, which had fallen due to the uh, consumption tax hike, and to accelerate earthquake recovery and uh, revitalize regional areas. My biggest expectation for the Abe government is acceleration of its growth strategy. First, I'd like to uh, talk about the three points. First, it's necessary to continue aggressively the regulating sectors where future growth is uh, targeted. Specifically, sectors, uh, specifically important sectors uh, is, uh, agriculture, healthcare, and uh, energy are the sectors where regulation has uh, inhibited the potential growth. Second point is uh, regional revitalization. Tokyo is the focus of most economic activity, which has caused regional areas uh, to suffer from population decline and uh, economic stagnation. Revitalization policies uh, required that leverage local economic advantages and benefit smaller businesses. Specifically, it is uh, necessary to open markets in Japan and abroad through production, processing, and the marketing of agriculture, uh, forestry, and the fishery products. Furthermore, there are regional tourism resources that are not being fully utilized. Last year, more than one, uh, 30 million foreign tourists visited Japan, getting them to realize there is more to Japan than simply Tokyo and Kyoto will help the reach the government's goal of 3 trillion yen in annual foreign tourists spending. Third point is the promotion of free trade. It is necessary to invigorate trade and investment in order to accelerate mutual economic growth in the Pacific region, including North and South America. In that sense, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, TPP, is of the highest priority. Finally, I would like to point out the importance of balancing economic growth and the physical soundness, the postponement of the additional increase in the consumption tax raised concern in some quarters regarding the uh, government's commitment to addressing the national debt, which led to the uh, downgrading of Japanese government bonds. That's a problem. With an aging society, it will be difficult to achieve the goal of balancing the budget in the medium term through a revenue enhancement and spending cuts alone. Reform of the entire fiscal and tax system, including society security, will be a very necessary issues. This is my comment. Thank, thank you, Kojiba san Thank you, and thank you for giving us sort of the context in full. Um, Takenaka san, can I um, press you on the security issues, the China issue, and you know, as Kojiba san pointed out, there has been a change in the handling of issues around the Ministry of Defence, around the defence budget change in the nature of the conversation around the Constitution. Can we just, will you just talk a little about that? 
Well, thank you raising, uh, for raising a very interesting question. But I'm an economist and the mm -hmm. former minister for economic <laughs> policy. I am not the right person to answer <laughs> this question exactly, but let me try. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it is it's true that uh, Prime Minister Abe had a very strong policy toward the new kind of uh, uh, diplomatic, diplomatic policy. It is important, first of all, to strengthen the domestic economy, then strengthen the power of diplomacy. It is quite understandable. Well, uh, at the same time, I uh, quite understand that he's a realist, realist. I worked with him together under the government for six years or so. Well, in the past six months or so, we had a very interesting question, interesting issue. That is the uh, Asian infra infra Infrastructure Investment Bank initiated by China. Well, uh, from a viewpoint of Japan and the United States, well, this seems to be a kind of, to some extent, disturbing the current order. Well, so the political scientists have a lot of discussion. Uh, Professor Tanaka is uh, here, maybe. And uh, I, I know from the viewpoint of economists, I hear this kind of discussion. China is uh, uh, the global partner or the challenger to the current uh, world order. Well, of course, the answer is not, not, not so easy, maybe. But at the same time, it is uh, very important to recognize the the geopolitical situation in East and Northeast Asia is changing a lot. In that sense, a prime minister had a very strong will to change something. But at the same time, as I mentioned, he's a realist. And he increased uh, the, uh, the defense budget, as you mentioned. But the, 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 this is a very small increase. And this is uh, his will to have a strong economy and a strong nation so that we can contribute to the stabilization, to, to the stability of the East Asia. In that sense, I'm, I understand I'd like to repeat again, he's a realist. And first of all, he'd like to, he will try to strengthen the domestic economy, and he will, in that sense, strengthen the relationship with the United States so that we can contribute to the stability of East Asia. Thank, thank you. Uh, I may turn, if I can, to Adam Posen now, actually, just on the, um, on the TPP issue. Um, in concrete terms, what do you expect is going to happen, Adam? Um, thank you, James. The, I think I need to bridge it just slightly to the political context. Mm -hmm. So in Japan's case, this is obviously part of trying to make itself not only closer allied with the US, but helping those countries around the region that it sees as potential allies is a little strong, but neighbors who can help keep China within check. So Taiwan as traditional, Thailand, but also Vietnam, Indonesia, and others. And of course, in the US case, this is an attempt to bring together both economics and security, as USTR Froman has very clearly said, although that's partly, that's how you sell it to a US audience, as you say, it's for foreign policy and security reasons, or you sell it to Congress that way. So realistically, it's important to get the US-Japan bilateral right, because Ambassador Froman and his counterpart in Japan, Minister Amari, have set up the dominoes. Basically, the, the, the thing that unlocks TPP, following on Mr. Kojima, is market access to Japan for agriculture and related products. That's the big gain. It's the big gain for Japan. Uh, I've done, we've done some estimates at the Peterson Institute that the average Japanese family could gain an additional $1,500 a year if there was sufficient liberalization. Uh, in the Japanese agriculture market. So the huge gains to TPP are for Japanese-owned people. But then if Japan and the US can agree on those, the dominoes fall because all these other lesser developed countries involved say, oh, gee, OK, you're going to give me that goody of access. I'm willing to sign up for stronger intellectual property right protections, stronger investor protections, all these things Japan and the US want. And then you turn back around and you go to Australia and Canada. Well, this is, what, this is the deal. You're in it or you're out. And so it really comes down to Japan and US getting past this impasse on agriculture. And the, in Japan, they keep saying, the diet members of the cabinet keep saying, well, you know, you can't force us to zero. It's embarrassing. The LDP party has said there are certain crops and things that we're not going to touch. And the US negotiators keep saying, if you don't give us enough on agriculture, we can't go to Congress, or we're going to have to ask for a lot more on auto parts, and you don't really want to go there. Mm -hmm. um, I am hopeful that in the next couple months, a deal will be reached, because they really are now down to negotiating about actual tariff levels on pork and beef. 
which is a crazy thing for the most important military alliance in the Pacific to be waiting on. <laughs> um, assuming we get that done and the US doesn't push Japan to zero and Japan does show a path to significantly lower tariffs there, leaving rice out of it, we could have a TPP proposal by March, April. The President Obama made it clear in his State of the Union address he wants to ask for TPA, note all the acronyms, what used to be called Fast Track, um, and Fast Track only makes sense if they have a deal to present to Congress because Congress doesn't give it in the abstract. And the deal has to be TPP because there's no other deals on the table that are anywhere. So it's potentially big. Listening to you, I'm struck by the frequency with which in the World Economic Forum you end up having a conversation about the interests of farmers. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, um, uh, Shimon Morrison, we'll come in a moment to the domestic agenda. Um, what, what Mr. Posen and Mr. Kojima refer to in the TPP is, if you like, quite a traditional uh, Japanese foreign policy position, cementing a relationship with the United States. Is the political position of the Liberal Democratic Party, is the LDP moving as regards the Constitution, defense, and its posture towards China? Thank you very much. If I may, I should like to refer to Japan-China relationship. At the outset, as you referred to, last year Prime Minister Abe, uh, during his stay in Davos, uh, made uh, some reference and that uh, caused uh, some commotions. That's what it's been reported. But actually, the interpreter's interpretation was the cause of that uh, issue. And the Prime Minister Abe refer to the current US uh, current China uh, Japanese relationship uh, uh, similar uh, to uh, UK and German relationship during the World War one I. I was listening to the conversation in Japanese directly and it did not it did not involve any problematic uh, uh, reference but uh, uh, the the general impression is that Abe uh, uh, cabinet uh, uh, is uh, becoming a right uh, 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 winged, uh, and uh, there may be some real issues involving Taken, uh, Senkaku Islands, but as uh, Professor Takenaka mentioned, Abe cabinet uh, and Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Abe is very realistic and taking the realistic approach. And during the uh, Beijing uh, APEC uh, uh, summit, after two years and six months, um, there has been a summit to talk between uh, Ch China and Japan, and we affirm the basic relationship uh, between J Japan and China that is mutually beneficial relationship based on common strategic interests. And based on that, in various areas, we will accumulate uh, dialogue and cooperation so that we can promote and develop a Japan-China relationship from the overall point of view. Towards the end of uh, November, um, Last year, I organized a Japan-China-Korea cultural ministers meeting in Yokohama. So in this way, there is a mutual agreement to promote a bilateral relationship in a solid way, including the grassroots relationship. But um, on the other hand, even after the uh, APEC meeting, the Chinese public vessels uh, uh, continue to uh, infringe and invade uh, the uh, Japanese EEZ, EEZ surrounding the Senkaku Islands. And uh, Japan will take a um, cool headed and uh, um, solid uh, response to Chinese uh, act of violence in this way. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for addressing that issue head on. Hasekawa san, finally on, the, on Japan and the foreign policy issues. Um, how, how do you see this, and particularly how do you look from a business perspective uh, at the issues in the region? Uh, first of all, uh, Japan, China, and Korea uh, started the trilateral free trade agreement discussion several years ago. However, uh, progress has been slow, and in, in the meantime, China and Korea claimed that they have reached agreement by the end of, before the end of last year. Uh, but uh, primarily, in my opinion, due to the uh, 
accelerate the progress of TPP, uh, particularly between the United States and Japan. Uh, two nations consist of more than 80% of the uh, GDP in the uh, 12 uh, uh, nations uh, participating in the TPP discussion. Uh, made them a little bit nervous because whenever Xi Jinping and uh, President Obama get together, uh, behind the scene, he always has the progress of TPP, even though the China is not prepared to join the TPP because of the uh, many, many state-owned enterprises uh, issues have not been solved. So uh, I, uh, with that in mind, uh, finally I learned that the China, even though has reached a, a bilateral agreement with Korea, uh, they are willing to resume the dis uh, trilateral discussion, including Japan, China, and Korea, which is a good sign. So I think uh, we need to uh, 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 push uh, full court press uh, in terms of the free trade agreement, particularly TPP, uh, because TPP is the most time constraint. Uh, within a few months, if we don't reach agreement, we may run out of time because it may take another six months to fine tune the, the you know, uh, sentences and the uh, uh, agree, uh, lines and sentences. Uh, by that time, uh, you know, the next year's uh, presidential election is near, near to start. So we, we better get this thing done as quick as possible. And in that respect, both uh, Japan and the United States are on the same page. So I'm very much encouraged. And uh, even the uh, TPP uh, progress is going to impact positively on the FTA negotiation with the EU as well. But when it comes to the security concerns uh, in uh, North Asia, uh, increasing due to the recent incidents that could easily escalate into a crisis that nobody wants, uh, such as uh, several incidents, uh, Chinese Air Force jet fighters are flying in the uh, uh, dangerously close proximity to Japan's self-defense air force uh, uh, jet fighters. Chinese Coast Guard vessels are fixing, uh, fixing uh, their weapons uh, radars on uh, Japan's Coast Guard vessels. Uh, Chinese Coast Guard vessels and even the fishing vessels making frequent incursion into Japanese territorial water around the Senkaku Island. Uh, China unilaterally set a new air defense identification zones uh, some of which overlaps uh, with Japan's existing uh, ADIZ. IZ. Japan and China have finally agreed, to, but Japan and China finally agreed to start uh, talks on the crisis prevention following uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, meeting at the APEC summit in Beijing last October, which is a good thing. Uh, but even though it was agreed upon until Last uh, you know, September, uh, last uh, December, nothing has happened. China was just watching the sea. Prime Minister Abe never visited uh, Yasukuni Shrine again, but it didn't happen. So now, uh, starting from this year, this uh, discussion is going to go start, which is absolutely necessary for the security of this part of the world. So uh, good signs are uh, showing here and there, but still we need to be very, very careful and cautious about the progress and not to destroy and not to break this kind of, uh, you know, fragile, fragile started the negotiation discussion. Okay, good. Well, well let's, uh, let's just take stock there for a moment uh, on the Japan and its global priorities. You know, there are not enough grounds for optimism in the world these days, but at least the, the last 15 minutes, I'd say, on foreign policy terms would make you feel rather optimistic. There's, it's clearly 2015 is the year for TPP. You would get the impression from this conversation that that's more likely to happen than not, um, that we need to be subtle and sophisticated in understanding the, the nature of the engagement between China and Japan, but it certainly doesn't feel uh, too alarmist. But I guess the, the crunch comes now, going back to uh, Takenaka-san's um, phrase, a strong economy being linked to a strong nation. How's Japan doing on the strong economy question? And um, you know, Prime Minister Abe's way of describing the economic issues, those three arrows, actually I think give each of our panelists a pretty easy way of addressing the Japanese economic question. Are the returns on fiscal stimulus diminishing? Is the capacity for monetary easing to make a significant uh, difference uh, to what's happening in the Japanese economy, particularly given what the Bank of Japan said yesterday about the inflation target? Is that struggling too? And how much is structural reform something that people pay lip service to but really struggle 
to deliver, particularly outside Tokyo. Can I start actually with you, Adam Posen, and give, if you like, a tour de raison of the, of the issues on the Japanese economy, and then I'll come through the panel. No, thank you. I mean, I, I, I in a sense, represent diversity, I guess. Um, <laughs> the, I, let, let me tackle this in reverse order. Um, uh, James is right to make a big deal out of Prime Minister Abe's speech here last year, which was groundbreaking. And on the economic side, as well as on the 1914 analogy, many people remember that he used the, the, the analogy or the image of Abe and his cabinet would be the drill bit, the diamond hard drill bit that would crush through interests. Um, and the answer is in reality, he's crushed through some and not others. And, and, and you know, it's, you always worry about the glass half empty, half full nonsense, and I don't want to leave you there. But the fact is, in light of what you said, James, at the start, there's a tendency to view either you're a supporter of Abe and you say everything's wonderful, or you're a skeptic on Japan and you say nothing's ever changed. And the answer is no, actually a lot has changed, but not enough. Um, so when we look at structural reform, um, you know, I think there are people in this room who've written about this as well as I in much greater detail, but you have to acknowledge that there's been a huge surge in female labor force participation in Japan in the last two years. And people on the outside of Japan have been, as well as some brave people inside Japan, have been saying for years the two biggest things you could do for the Japanese economy is either start making better use of the well-educated women you have or start having immigration. You can be racist or sexist, you can't be both. And um, so what remains is they're partially sexist, but at least there's progress. Um, and so we have roughly 600,000 women over trend who've joined the labor force or become active in the labor force over the last two years. And that's a huge number. That's, that's, that's more than 1% of the labor force, okay? Remember, when we talk about participation problems in the US, we're talking about a couple percent. This is a historic move. And there's still room to expand it, not just by reducing sexism, but particularly by changing the tax code, which penalizes two-income families. But the bottom line is, this is enough to offset demographic decline in the labor force, I mean, I defer to Hazo, but roughly for five, six years. This is a very big number. And another thing is people say, well, a lot of it's part-time or informal work, and that's true, but we know from the Nordics and from France that if you want to keep women in the labor force, it's very important to have flexible work arrangements, so you shouldn't poo-poo it on that ground. But that leads to the monetary issue, and as you mentioned, the trouble the Bank of Japan seems to be having of meeting its 2% inflation target. One of the things that gets into technical arcana, but you, you, when you're a central bank, you can choose to target some version of what we call core inflation, which is supposed to be the underlying trend or headline, which the advantage of headline is everybody understands it, and you're not seen as making excuses, the disadvantage of headline is it goes up and down all the time. And the headline inflation rate in Japan, which is basically what the Japanese Bank of Japan targets, leave aside food, um, has been going down in part because you've added 600,000 people to the workforce mm. and you're making more flexible the workforce in various ways and women do get paid less than men, especially if they're part time. And so you have this transitional thing where there's downward pressure on wages. This is good for Japan it's growth, ultimately, but just as with Germany in 2003, 4, 5, after labor market reforms, you saw a disinflationary trend. And the Bank of Japan, there are other factors like the energy shock. The Bank of Japan, if I was sitting there as I used to at Bank of England, I'd be saying, look past that. Stick to your guns and say, okay, that's temporary. We're going to look past that. But it's hard because Governor Kuroda promised to get to two. Um, sorry, I'm going on too long, I'll just very quick. I, in the context when all of us, I'm very glad to see such a full room here observing on Japan at the same time the ECB is fiddling. Um, <laughs> the, the, you know, it, it still remains that the Bank of Japan's new approach is far superior to what the ECB is about to announce because they're not defining their success by the amount bought in a certain period of time. They're defining their success by getting to the inflation goal. And they keep saying they will readjust what they need to do in order to get to the inflation goal, and that's right. The third arrow, fiscal, that's where I think the biggest disappointment lies, in addition to the fact that there are a lot of other structural reforms like agriculture that haven't yet been pursued. I mean, the women's stuff is more important than anything else, but there's still a lot of other stuff to pursue. 
On taxes, Hazel and I have debated this, others can speak from the business community in Japan. I'll just say that it's true that the tax hike and the consumption tax was more harmful to the economy for longer than people expected. Nonetheless, if you don't start raising taxes now, you're just going to have to raise more later. And so I think it is unfortunate that the government postponed the tax increase. Thank you. Dr. Nankastan, can I, can I turn to you? And will you just pick up particularly on the point around household incomes and whether or not we're likely to see any movement in that? Because it, for some people, it seems a mystery. Well, thank you. Well, Adam gave us a very comprehensive uh, explanation of um, what's happening in the Japanese economy and economic policy. You raised the question about household income. Yes, because of the tax hike last year, uh, the consumption, uh, household consumption declined a lot. And the situation where the, where the so-called deflation in mind is ex uh, existing, it was very risky to raise uh, tax consumption tax rate. Uh, but anyway, this was decided by the former government not other governments, so it has nothing to do with economics. That's right. Well, uh, maybe th this should be d described by uh, our <laughs> Minister Shimomura. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the class of Economics 101, we quite often learn improving the total is different from improving all. To increase GDP means to improve the total economy. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily mean the old people are well, they improved. It's happening uh, now in Japan, but the, the main purpose of Abenomics is to improve the total. Before Abenomics started, the total GDP had been declining, minus 2%, and Abenomics changed to positive 2% growth. This is a very important step. Very unfortunately, consumption tax hike stopped that trend, but anyway, uh, the Abenomics is going to restart. But under such circumstances, anyway, uh, first of all, it is very important to improve the total and strengthen the uh, competitiveness, the productivity, as was mentioned by uh, Adam. And of course, uh, there are still many things to do. And uh, many empirical studies say, well, there's some time lag uh, between the main economic indicator and the labor and the rate of indicators. So I think sooner or later, well, the wage will also start increase. Actually, business leaders like Kojima-san, Sega-san, well understand that. And so, well, important point is, anyway, to show the very strong attitude for the reform. Adam also, also mentioned the, uh, the policy of Bank of Japan. Bank of Japan, Mr. Kuroda changed the expectation of the people, expe expectation of the market. Mm -hmm. So it is now very important to give another expectation or to the people, to the market, through very strong attitude of the reform of the government. Now we are in that kind of process. For the details of uh, uh, reform policy, maybe, uh, you hear Adam mentioned the uh, labor market reform. Yes, this is important, and also uh, some other uh, issues, uh, medical care, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, one important message is, uh, in order to make a breakthrough for all bedrock regulations, we have so-called bedrock regulations, the Prime Minister decided to establish the special economic zone, strategic special economic zone. Its system already had started. And this special economic zone uh, very, very completely different from labor, uh, flex, much more flex labor uh, market uh, could be created, and various kind of degradation will be lifted. So now, it's, uh, now we are in the very strong start point. Very fortunately, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, got a very landslide victory in the last election, obtaining two-thirds majority of the Diet. It is indicating now Prime Minister has a very uh, strong and stable political base. The problem is how to make use of this political capital, and how to uh, allocate this political capital to each policy. Thank you. Uh, Hasegawa-san, I'll turn to you now, and again, just, just going back to the three arrows, it's still people are trying to understand how effective they're being. On the structural reform one, I'd also ask you just to talk a little bit, a bit about how you see structural reform in the healthcare industry, if you see it really happening. Well, uh, general understanding of uh, first hour and second hour monetary easing and also the uh, uh, decent side of the stimulus package uh, worked out very well, and the government is prepared to do ad additional stimulus package if it's necessary, just like now. And the ultimate goal of Abenomics, in my opinion, is to create the virtuous cycle of the economy. 
uh, first uh, corporate earning growth, uh, increase in the capital investment, wage increase and the unemployment uh, decrease, uh, tax revenue increase, uh, sustainable growth and the financial consolidations. Those uh, uh, virtual cycle has need to be uh, created. That's the ultimate goal. To make that happen, the first uh, administration needs to show uh, their will to executing the bad luck uh, you know, regulation uh, breakthrough. Uh, it is called uh, structural reforms. Structural reform, in this case, uh, uh, compared to the previous ad administration, the administration has done much better job, but still those are not deep enough and strong enough and fast enough. That is the problem, because I was uh, very much interested, uh, interestingly find after coming to Davos this year, even European people are talking about uh, structural reform and the particular if peripheral countries in the uh, EU community, mm -hmm. uh, they haven't done uh, you know, deep enough and uh, wide enough uh, structural reforms. But in Japan, if it, you apply this to the Japan's case, you know, not only agriculture uh, you know, reform, uh, uh, overall uh, design is already done pretty well, so it's a matter of how to legislate that in uh, this coming regular diet session. And the medical reform and the health care reform, not as good as uh, uh, agriculture, but still waiting for the legislation. But when it comes to the labor uh, uh, workforce uh, liberalization, it was not good enough yeah, because of the, uh, uh, the strong, uh, uh, you know, against uh, from the vested interested group, you, can, you name it. So uh, we have a long way to go. Therefore, even after uh, winning the landslide victory in the December election, which gave Abe administration another four years, you know, golden time to prioritize, uh, at, uh, you know, how to implement issues, to tackle on one, one after another. But still, those bedrock are not uh, cultivated enough and drilled enough. So the, that is the next test. Uh, we are carefully watching, but not only watching as a by, by a standard, but also we are working uh, closely with the government to encourage and help government to tackle on those issues. Otherwise, just like uh, Germany did in the early 2000s, uh, we, we cannot ca come back a strong man like Germany did in the EU in Japan. That's the bottom line, in okay. my opinion. Um, Kojima-san, can I turn to you for your economic analysis. But in particular, I wanted you to elaborate on the point about the regions in Japan. Um, I was struck by your comment about tourists needing to go beyond Tokyo and Kyoto. I have to say, I, when I studied Japanese, they sent me to Kushiro in Hokkaido. <laughs> That's a nice um, place. <laughs> it's a lovely place. Everyone should go there. It's also, by the way, the foggiest city in Japan. I think they thought that would be good for a Londoner. Um, um, but, but, but it's obviously becoming a bigger issue, this, the disparity between the regions and the big cities in Japan. And in your economic analysis, would you just elaborate on that point? Well, yeah, I am a member of the uh, Keidan Ren. And uh, I went to the uh, Hokkaido Keidan Ren, Hokuriku Keidan Ren, and the Chubu Keidan Ren, Shikoku Keidan Ren, and also Kyushu. And uh, I can communicate with the local people then everybody expecting tourism and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly in Hokkaido area, <laughs> tourism and uh, tourists is now coming a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is very important. And also, uh, Hokkaido, the uh, agricultural uh, you know, uh, resource uh, quality is uh, very, very good. And uh, the temperature is getting hotter, and therefore, much more good products will be, you know, uh, uh, getting in, in the uh, Hokkaido area. And uh, the other area is the same. Therefore, there are so many factors to encourage the uh, local and uh, regional economy. And uh, under such circumstances, and uh, uh, local by local, they try to find out what is the best way. And under such circumstances, you talk about the uh, relationship between China and Japan. And I'd like to tell something about that. Yes. Quite recently, I visited uh, Shanghai and uh, Tenshin. And uh, you may know 
uh, oh, sorry. Uh, our company has the, uh, the biggest office outside of Japan, was the New York office. Hmm. But uh, now the biggest office of Mitsubishi Corporation is the Shanghai office. In China, we have uh, more than 14 offices. They are working very hard. <laughs> then uh, under such circumstances, new customer is now approaching to us from China. Hmm. And the very reliable, big, very reliable business uh, uh, group, I, when I went to the uh, Shanghai, they invited me for the dinner mm -hmm. in the Shanghai port. They arranged a very big uh, cruise ship for the very big uh, restaurant there. And uh, this is the uh, number one chef in China who will serve this one. And uh, also the best shokoshu. <laughs> And uh, that was very good. And uh, we are cruising the uh, port and uh, discuss about the new business. And therefore, as far as the business relationship is concerned, we don't worry so much about. Under such circumstances, even Xi Jinping tried to open the door. Therefore, say, I, I don't worry so much about. And uh, this is also very important. And uh, in terms of the TPP, how to protect the agricultural industries, that is uh, not so good. How to encourage the you know, agricultural business is uh, very important for the TPP. And uh, if try to cooperate, co um, protect TPP and agriculture, and uh, agricultural people who are involved in the agricultural industry in Japan is uh, almost uh, 70 years old. Mm -hmm. And the younger generation feels, ah, this is the uh, job for the elderly people, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, agricultural industries should be the younger generation's you know, business for future. Mm -hmm. This is the same in the uh, Australia, Canada. And uh, the agricultural industries people have to you know, graduate university, and they have to know the IT. Mm -hmm. And this is the agricultural people throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Therefore. Japanese you know, government should uh, strongly emphasize, emphasize this point. Very good, okay. Yeah, and cool. uh, let them go to the Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very big, uh, you know, a, uh, agricultural zone, special zone, controlled by the uh, GD, GPS. And most of the agricultural equipment is uh, robotics. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is related to uh, derivative. Therefore, Grand Terminal is a computer room. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if this is a message from the government <laughs> to the uh, uh, younger generation, they will try to you know, uh, develop more good business in the agricultural industries. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Kojima-san. Sure. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn over in a moment to questions and, and comments. Um, but um, uh, obviously, one of the uh, great things of sessions like this is that if you're a minister of government, everyone comments on the work you're doing, and you have to sit politely. And, uh, and listen, I wanted to give Shimomura-san a chance to, for the Abe administration to, to account for itself. And, and also, if you, you will, Shimomura-san, just to pick up on a point that, uh, that Mr. Takan Takenaka made about the political culture of Japan. You've seen a strong commitment, big commitments on fiscal stimulus, um, strong talk on structural reform, and from the Bank of Japan too, moments that have really taken the world by surprise, it seems as though there's a more dynamic culture in Japanese politics, and yet at the same time there's a higher level of public disengagement given the low turnout at the elections in December. So will you just give us a political flavour too to what's happening in the Japanese economy? Thank you very much for that. Let me start out by saying the reactivation of the local areas starting in September of last year, and number two of the Liberal Democratic Party, Mr. Ishiba, the Secretary General, 
is now in charge of the reactivation of the local areas. He's in charge, minister in charge of that. So Abe cabinet is uh, committed to reactivating not just Tokyo region, but the rest of the country. And uh, there will be many uh, new laws put in place about the um, labor, and uh, there are about 90 bureaucrats. And from my ministry, we have sent 15 bureaucrats uh, for that purpose, education, culture, sports, science and technology. That comes under my purview. And these are all areas that will be built in the future of Japan, and they will become the future industries of Japan. For that reason, there has been no point uh, relations with the universities, the schools. Uh, we need to get in touch with them and so that we will choose the industry that is suited to that region and develop uh, people who would be that, so, so that we would like to have a good relationship with, with the local areas to um, grow the industry. We talked about the tourism. We had 13 million people come to Japan last year. The first uh, arrow, that was the uh, bold uh, monetary policy and uh, fiscal uh, policy. And in the December uh, election, the biggest priority is uh, economic uh, growth, reverse of economy. It's going to take time, but there's nothing else. And uh, the government has the trust of the people through that election, and uh, we will continue with the two-thirds majority of the House. We will continue the uh, policies taken so far. I believe for the future, in 2020, the Olympic Games and Paralympic Games should be a very important chance for culture and arts. We should have 20 million people visit us on 2020. 2030, we hope that we will have 30, 000, uh, 30 million uh, foreigners uh, come to Japan, not just to Tokyo, not just to Kyoto. Of course, Hokkaido and other regions, is because there are treasures that are sleeping now. So this is a big scheme of uh, Japan's heritage, and we will involve the culture and the arts so that the people around the world would think, oh, I want to get to see Japan. So in 2016, we will have Olympic Games, Paralympics in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, I would be uh, talking with uh, Dr. Schwab. We will hopefully we will have a world forum limited to culture and uh, sports, sports culture, and uh, I think that could contribute to the um, reactivation of uh, Japan. So that's what I was thinking of. A political culture, unlike other countries. Uh, we can dissolve the House when the cabinet is the uh, strongest. In other countries, you've got to wait until your uh, term ends. But in Japan, we can dissolve the House, and uh, we can continue to uh, win the trust of the people by dissolving the House, having another election. So with the election in December, we will now have four years, and the people have supported that. We should accelerate that. Uh, democracy takes time. Mr. Hasegawa has just said, structural reform, deregulation just taking too much time, too slow. We're not a dictatorship, so the government can't do what it wants to do. Well, we need to wait for consensus. It may take time, but uh, it's going to be best to reactivate uh, Japan. Uh, agricultural reform, deregulation of labor market, medical field, of course, but this year we would start by uh, we have protected the 
agricultural area, but uh, Mr. Kojima was uh, talking about the Australian case. We would like the Japanese farmers, Japanese agricultural sector, to export uh, beautiful Japanese uh, produce. Uh, some of them are really very good. And uh, it just says that uh, Abe has the trust of the people. A stable government will be able to do this and much more. So the world can look forward to Japan. Um, James, James. I will, will you forgive me one second, Alan, because yeah. I want to make sure we get some questions and comments. Um, and they're going to be a few. Um, to sum up that, just uh, I know it's a lot. We've gone across a lot of territory very quickly. Um, my quick summary uh, would be that um, the drill bit is probably a little blunter than it was in fiscal stimulus. Uh, the wall has got a little harder when it comes to monetary policy, and um, structural reform has punched a few holes, but the wall's still there. So questions. Um, uh, um, I'm going to to um, to you and then to you, Kathy Kobayashi. Uh, my name is Len Kabayashi. I'm a young global leader from Japan. Um, being a young, uh, or re relatively young, uh, female living in Japan, I just wanted to touch upon three things, which is gender parity um, and entrepreneurship and education, and provide some specific examples of why I believe that Japan is, think, uh, is changing. Um, so on gender disparity, I know Kathy said I was talking, going to give you, about, give you a macro view of this issue, but um, I'm on a micro level, um, I serve on a, one of the committees under Shimomura-san, uh, and uh, um, I have two little children, uh, one and five, and live in Nagano Prefecture, which is about half an hour an, an away from Tokyo. And he allowed me to serve his committee through Skype, while he himself is present in the meeting room. So that's how Japan is changing. Um, on, uh, on entrepreneurship, um, I graduated from a Tokyo University in 1998, you can tell my age, <laughs> don't calculate. Um, and, um, and a majority of my best friends are entrepreneurs, including myself. So that, I guess, tells you something. And the third one is on education. Um, our school um, is an international school uh, where 70% of our student body comes from all over the, all over the world. And 95% of our faculty are non-Japanese. And we, um, the language of instruction is English. And the Ministry of Education has, been, has accredited our school to be a Japanese school. And the minister uh, very kindly, generously came to our opening ceremony last summer. Um, and uh, I think it was, it's really unheard of that a school like ours is accredited by the Minister of, minister of Education. So I think that really gives you, as James said at the beginning, that you, you think you understand something about Japan, but actually you didn't, or maybe <laughs> you did. <laughs> so that's my two cents. Thank you. Of course, thank you very much. Cathy, do you want to? You should come here. <laughs> <laughs> There's over here. Yes. I'm gonna, so I'm going to take a few questions and comments at a time and then come back two, to the panel. Two quick questions. Um, first, a topic that was not, I'm from Goldman Sachs, Tokyo, by the way, but uh, first, a topic that I'm surprised nobody mentioned that I think in the third arrow has seen radical speed of change is corporate governance. And I'm interested in Hasegawa-san and Kojima-san's uh, business perspective. Uh, we had a stewardship code introduced actually from the UK last year for asset managers. A new corporate governance code is going to be introduced this coming June. That's actually going to force Japanese companies to explain why they own cross shareholdings. Isn't that kind of radical? Um, so any comments there? And secondly, for Shimomura Daijin, uh, on the gender um, initiatives, I agree completely with Adam Posen that there has been uh, significant progress. However, we do need to put more pressure on uh, society. And, and I know there's a, is it Jose Katsuyakuhon, or some kind of legislation pending that will actually force Japanese companies to establish diversity targets and action plans to reach those goals. So just interested, mm -hmm. is that going to pass? Or do I have to tell my clients that, you know, don't, don't be too hopeful? <laughs> Very good. And Peter, you would be interesting to hear the panel. Introduce yourself. Uh, Peter Woldowski, uh, editor in chief from Sweden, Dagens Nyheter. It would be interesting to hear the panel say something about the European economic situation compared to Japan. What can Europe learn from Japan? Um, very good. Are there any other comments or questions? Yes, sir, at the back. 
Thank you. Um, uh, Eric Mindich from Eaton Park in New York for uh, Shimon Morrison. I'm curious on the um, integrated resort spill, um, uh, why that's taken so long, what the prospects are, and how important that is for the Olympics. Hmm. Okay. Um, um, very good. Let's, let, let's have a go at a few of those questions. Could I ask the panel to keep their answers very brief as we have just about five minutes left. Um, Frank Shima Morrison, I think you get the bulk of the work here. Um, uh, uh, let's take the last question first, the question about the Olympics and uh, the integrated resorts legislation, um, but also to Cathy's point about the changes in uh, uh, targets and diversity. Hi. First, about the gender equality and the promotion of women's participation uh, bill. In the ordinary diet session this year, it will be passed. Yes, I will make sure it will pass. And also, and the gender issue uh, and the women's uh, activity promotion law, including uh, the gender equality, for the government as a whole, we will make uh, the no child care facility waiting line. The 400,000 children will be uh, accommodated. And also, after school, when mothers are still working, uh, the children cannot uh, go back home and uh, stay in a locked apartment. So uh, we have a after-school child care uh, plan. The government take, uh, take initiative to introduce a scheme for each school so that from child-rearing point of view, women feel re um, assured of um, working. And about IR, I am a, a strong promoter uh, promoting that, and uh, globally, the casino is uh, um, approved as a facility, but in Japan, there is still a sense of position about uh, gambling and also gambling uh, uh, dependency or addiction. And mass media is uh, very against it. In Japan, we have a pinball game, pachinko. Uh, any, anyone can go and visit the pachinko parlor. But the casino is the restricted area, and uh, you need a passport to go in. But that restriction is not fully understood in Japan. So in the course of this year, by um, uh, adopting this and passing this uh, bill this year so that uh, by Olympics and Paralympics in 2020, it can become a major strong tool in inviting more foreign tourists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a difficult task. Corporate governance reform, um, Kojima-san uh, and then Asagawa-san, can you just give us one concrete example of how things will change? Maybe in my question, I, mean, I, I got a question, something about the uh, uh, third arrow expansion of the economy. Actually, unfortunately, we're not going to have time, <laughs> uh, realistically, because I'd just like oh, to get an answer. How's it going, son? Do you want to try first? Just, I want to get one concrete example, uh, and I'll come back to Kojima-san, okay. just if we've got time. Uh, it's just, just a matter of time. Once government decided to enforce and the mandate the uh, corporations to have a multiple non-executive board members, it will happen landslidingly. So it's, a, it's just a matter of time. It's really a shame until we get that kind of mandate. No uh, initial initiative, uh, you know, individual initiative that took place. By the same token, the corporate chairship, already more than 106 uh, or seven or 10 uh, uh, institutional investors signed up, signed up uh, for the corporate chairship. So it's going to happen again. So both will happen very, very short period of time, overwhelming uh, speed and, and the magnitude. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, do you agree just on corporate governance about the nature of the change? Yeah, corporate governance is a very, very important issue. And uh, frankly speaking, our company has the uh, more than 600 uh, subsidiary companies. And the subsidiary companies have to uh, make a corporate governance and the completely. Now, we are educating the people and also, and uh, we select so many outside of directors and uh, also try to communicate with them. 
And uh, sometimes it's very hard for all directors to understand what we are doing and say, maybe you should uh, know the uh, trading company, uh, uh, most of the profit was the trading. But uh, now, business model is changing. And now our business model is the, uh, say, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the profit uh, coming from the investment. And uh, we are now uh, told that uh, your business model is changing from the trading to the investment of banker. But we invest not only money, but also human resources. Human resources, education, or the management of human resources is very, very important, particularly from now. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Adam Posen, I interrupted you. Did you have anything urgent to say? Just, just quickly. Um, the Yabe administration has gotten a bit of a good ride on this panel, including from me, and I think it's important to do a corrective. Well, Kathy Matsui is right about the intent on corporate governance reform. Nothing has really changed, and we know from the U.S. and the U.K., you can have the right corporate governance on paper, and it still doesn't matter. So I wouldn't put too much on that. But second and more importantly, I very much contest what the minister said and what Hezo said. Originally, the special economic zones were supposed to be a means of reducing health costs and improving labor markets, and were supposed to take part of Osaka and Tokyo. Instead, they got hijacked by the backbenchers of the LDP to be another handout to elderly in the rural areas. So if you're looking for your test case that the politics in Japan have gone wrong, it's the special economic zones. Adam Posen, thank you very much. On that needling note, um, a, a good one to end on. Um, uh, I wanted to thank you all for uh, coming here this morning and for the interest in what's happening in, uh, in Japan and the region. But please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you very much indeed.